I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. Um, a motion is in order for the approval of the closed session agenda. Ms. Jesse. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Um, any discussion? Or second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I, I second. Okay, discussion. Please vote. Vote is six yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Okay. Uh, moving on to the motion to enter closed session. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I uh, move that pursuant to Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711 that the Prince William County School Board enter closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss and consider the assignment appointment performance disciplining and resignation of specific employees, appointees, or officers. Mm -hmm to the PWCS board and Virginia code in sections 2.2-3711A1 .2 and 8. Two, to consult with division council and receive legal advice regarding actual and probable litigation where such consultation and briefing in open session will adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of this board under Virginia code sections 2.2-3711A7 uh, and three, to receive legal advice from division council regarding the use of social media by public officials under Virginia code sections 2.2-3711A8. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Any discussion? The vote is six yes, unanimous. Motion passed. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session and return in open session in approximately one hour. Items. So we'll move to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda, which will be 7.01. Do I have a motion? A motion's in order. Mr. Wilk. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session consent agenda as recommended. Mr. Do I have a second? Ms. Ralston? I second. Any discussion? Please vote. I'm waiting on Mr. Deutsch. And you have to refresh. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Uh, next, we'll move on to the closed session certification. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I'm, uh, I motion that pursuant to Virginia Code sections 2.23712, the closed session of Prince William County School Board meeting on March 6, 2019, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in closed meeting, to which the certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse. I second. Any discussion? Please vote. So at, the, at this time, we are going to, because- the vote is eight, yes, unanimous, right. motion Thank passed. You. So right before we do the public hearing on the budget, we're gonna do our pr um, presentation positively PWCS because of our um, students who are here have to leave a little bit early and they won't be able to stay throughout the budget presentation uh, or the public hearing. So this school year, we're kicking off the business of our meetings with a response to the community request to hear more about good things that our school students, staff members are accomplishing. Our goal is to spotlight a few of the good news items at these meetings and elsewhere with the term positively PWCS. Many of you have heard about the local media star, Eric Bean McKay, whose social media campaign to solicit peanut butter helped many furloughed workers. 
Eric attends Hilton High School, and I'm very excited that he is here tonight to tell us a little bit more about his story. Kimberly Nye, special edu- from the Special Education Department head at Hilton High School, is here this evening to kick off our presentation. Ms. Nye. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, members of the Prince William County School Board, and guests. As mentioned, I am the Department Chair for Special Education at C.D. Hilton High School. I would like to acknowledge Mr. Cassidy, our principal, Ms. Holland, our assistant principal over special education, and Mr. Campagna, Eric's case manager. And of course, please stand, Eric. That's you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me here tonight to speak about Eric. Eric was recently recognized for his love of Lidl's peanut butter when he posted a picture on Twitter of 70, 72 jars he had consumed. Lidl sent him 72 more jars of their peanut butter and offered to give him a lifetime supply if he could achieve 72,000 retreats of his picture, which he easily did. Eric then spent a day passing out some of his peanut butter to furloughed government workers. Additionally, Eric donated 1,800 more jars to, of his peanut butter to the Axe Food Bank. Thank you. Eric is a freshman at Hilton High School. He is a talented, quiet, and polite young man with autism. His teachers describe him as intelligent, engaging, empathetic, hardworking, an enthusiastic student with a unique sense of style, as you can tell. (laughs) Eric is an AB honor roll student. He earned five A's, a B, and a B plus his his first semester as a freshman at Hilton High School. When I met with Eric, he was very humble and soft-spoken about donating part of his lifelong peanut butter supply. When I asked Eric why he donated his peanut butter, he simply stated, I enjoy giving back to my community because it's the right thing to do. Eric does not give back for recognition. In fact, he's looking for other opportunities to get involved in the school and to help others in the community. And in April, Lidl is working with Eric um, in conjunction with um, the Autism Awareness Project. So they'll be doing more with him. So that's another big, bright thing for him. Eric's compassion and genuine concern for others make him a bright star. He will be one of our future leaders and a change maker of his generation. Our world at Hilton is a kinder place because of Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knight. Thank you, Eric. Congratulations for that terrific effort and great work. Thank you again. Um, at the next, the next part of this is the public hearing for the budget. Um, so I have this nice declaration to make. Um, so just for everyone here in the room, we're going to do um, comment time on the Prince William County fiscal year 2020 budget. That will happen. Once we're done with that, we will then officially kick off the board meeting, and we're going to try to re- rearrange some of the um, agenda for, for that as well. So... Um, but just to make things go smoothly. So I'm gonna make my statement. I declare that, this is hilarious, but okay. I declare that a public hearing is now open on the subject of the school board's fiscal year 2020 proposed budget and CIP. Any citizen who has signed up to speak on this subject may do so when called upon. Um, Okay, so I will then go to our list for the budget. Do we have that list? Mm-hmm. The um, first person is Lorena Clark. Okay, my name is Lorena Clark. My address and phone number are on file with the clerk. Dr. Waltz, Chairman Latif, board members. In my many years of teaching, I have met new teachers excited and passionate about teaching their students. First year teachers and veterans alike. As the wealth of knowledge in my building, and more specifically, my team of teachers grew, our students benefited from our wealth of knowledge and experience. This goes for any district. Since returning to Prince William County in the fall of 2013, I noticed many veteran teachers leaving the county for districts that pay more, fan, that pay more 
fantastic teachers to never look back at Prince William County and are benefiting other students in other communities. I personally was offered a salary increase of $10,000 to go to another county. I considered it, but my commute is long enough right now and I enjoy where I'm at. I know the proposed salary increase won't raise my salary by $10,000, but I know I'm worth the proposed raise and more as are the other teachers in the county. Other people who are worth the increase are our students who deserve to know their teachers won't be poached by another division or moved to the private sector. So please fund our future now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Kate Olson Flynn. While you're coming up, let me let me call up the next um, five people. They can come up and grab a seat up front. Uh, Megan Link and Cyrus Wins, Riley O'Casey, uh, um, Majory Lathers, uh, Les Klein. Okay. Dr. Olson Flynn. Hi. Good evening, uh, school board, Chairman Latif, Dr. Waltz. I'm Kate Olson, Dr. Kate Olson Flynn, and you have my address on file. It's good to see you all here on this cold Wednesday evening. First, I'd like to applaud you all in creating a budget that is responsive to the public's demands for a pay raise for teachers, more mental health professionals, and money allotted to reduce class sizes and to provide more pre-K, particularly for economically disadvantaged students. The money that you dedicate to improving the socio-emotional and academic well-being of our children and the teachers and staff who work with them will directly benefit our communities and help create better futures for all. For this, I commend Dr. Waltz and his administration on the priorities that this budget upholds. In addition, I would like to thank you for recognizing the inequity of the gym space at Garfield and Woodbridge High Schools by allocating money in the budget to add an auxiliary gym to these schools. I thank you for hearing and listening to parents who care, who advocated for this improvement for two years. However, there is one caveat, as always with me, right? <laughs> I ask that you please ensure that the space that you plan to construct enables the school to have three full courts for the students, teachers, coaches, and teams to use, as other high schools have. It, 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 it would be a shame to construct a space that only provides a school with one extra court, thereby perpetuating the inequity that exists in the gym space across the county, and therefore providing parents who care with yet another thing that we will have to complain about in the future. <laughs> Equally important to adding two extra full courts to the auxiliary gym is more storage. Our original structure for the gym was built in the 1970s before many female athletic teams existed, making our current building unable to house and keep the various equipment and materials that all these additional sports and teams require. For this reason, I ask the board to ensure that whatever plan is proposed for the auxiliary gym, that it includes space for storage and for all sports teams and PE classes that use the facility, and maybe some extra space just in case. As always, I think, thank each of you for your time and consideration of our concerns and requests to improve the access to our, of our students to equitable facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be... Um Together, Megan Link and Cyrus Wins. Good evening to everyone on the dais. My name is Megan Link, and my address is on file. I yield my time to my favorite Prince William County student. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, Chairman Latif, Vice Chairman Wilk, and members of the school board. My name is Cyrus Wins, and my address is on file. I am a fourth grader at Ellis Elementary School. I love my school and I love to learn. The most significant factor in my love for both school and learning has been my exceptional teachers. I want to give a shout out to Ms. Wisniewski, my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Anderson, who got married and is now Ms. Fisher, my first grade teacher, Ms. Goodson, my second grade teacher, and Ms. Larkin, my third grade teacher. This year in fourth grade, I am fortunate to have Miss Goodson for a second time, as well as Miss Hartz as my teachers. I also have contact with Alice administrators, resource teachers, and support staff. 
but as I don't want to leave anyone out and my Nana told me I only have three minutes to speak with you, I will not name them, but I do want you and them to know how much they are appreciated. This evening, I specifically chose to list all my teachers, past and present, because they represent the absolute best of what Prince William County Public Schools and Ellis Elementary offers students. I know from experience that good teachers make all the different in student achievement. For this reason, I want to thank you for prioritizing a step plus a COLA for employees in the proposed 2019 to 2020 school division budget. After accompanying my grandmother to union meetings and events, I have come to understand the importance of being able to, in the world, in the words I have heard repeated so many times, attract, recruit, and retain excellent educators. This year, for the very first time, I even attended VEA's Lobby Day in Richmond. Thank you all for understanding that competitive employee pay is critical to ensure that all Prince William County students, including me, will continue to receive a quality public education. I am grateful to have the opportunity to share a student's thoughts with you this evening. Thank you. Riley O'Casey. I can't follow that. <laughs> Good evening. I I've, I've known him since he was about this big, so this is exciting to see that. Good evening, Dr. Latif, board members, Dr. Waltz. My name is Riley O'Casey, and I'm the president of the Prince William Education Association. Throughout my 15 years of advocating for our members and speaking at many, many, many board meetings, the superintendent's proposed budget for the 2019-2020 school year is the best I have seen. In addition to the proposed increased compensation for employees, the increase in school counselors, the focus on equity with a nurse in every school and assistant principals in all elementary schools, and sustaining the class size reduction, I'm excited to learn that the General Assembly state budget has direct aid coming to Prince William County Schools to free up local dollars, which will ensure the increase in staff sal salaries. It is estimated that we will receive an additional $31.5 million in funds. I urge this board to support the proposed budget. I've given a state budget summary provided by the Virginia Education Association to Mrs. Urban for your information and pleasure reading. Thank you. <laughs> Majory Lathers? Marjorie. Ma I'm sorry. Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Marjorie Lathers, and I'm a, and my address is on file. I'm a National Board Certified Physical Education Teacher in my 20th year teaching, 10 of those with Prince William County. I am passionate about what I do and have been a voice for my profession and students on Capitol Hill in Washington and at our state capitol in Richmond. I thank you for this opportunity to request equal compensation for and two certified physical education teachers for all elementary schools. Every day we teach double classes to meet the needs of 50 to 60 students at a time for six blocks, averaging 330 students taught per day. For the standards-based grading requirements at nine grades needed per student per quarter, that's roughly 330 grades required from one teacher every day and a half. Our classes include at-risk students, students with a wide range of abilities and medical concerns, and mainstream students with special needs. This wide variety of students in a double class setting is taught by one certified teacher. The state of Virginia requires that only certified physical educators teach elementary, middle, and high school PE. Yet at the elementary level, we are given twice the load to instruct and assess on a daily basis. We are assigned teacher aides in place of an additional certified teacher for our additional classes. Teacher aides are not certified to teach. From a risk management safety standpoint, teacher aides are not schooled in instructing movement-related content, leading to a higher risk of student injury. 
This approach limits us from what we can effectively provide to the large number of students in our care. The potential that technology brings to physical education is exciting. We are up to date on and schooled on all that we can use to enhance learning experiences for our students. It is impossible, though, for one trained and certified teacher supported by an uncertified assistant to effectively utilize and bring to life the promise of technology with the number of students we are given. What we do is important and is no longer seen as just a filler in the school day. We are thrilled that the United States Congress elevated both health and physical education in the Every Student Succeeds Act passed in 2015 by including them as part of a student's well-rounded education. Teaching can be difficult. Students arrive in our classroom with needs that are all but impossible to address. Nevertheless, our passion for physical education enables us to come to school each day and make magic happen. For so many of our students, the time they spend with us is the highlight of their day. We do what matters, what we do matters, and to do so passionately is the greatest gift we can give to ourselves and to our students. We ask that you help fund the future and assist us in providing the world-class instruction and experience we know our students deserve. I respectfully request your support of equal compensation and two certified physical educators in all elementary schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So while uh, Mr. Les Klein is at the podium, if uh, Corinne Hogan, Corey Love, Courtney Mann, Patty Swanson and Rachel Freeman, please come up to the front. That'd be great. Mr. Klein. Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Les Klein. My address is on file. I am here along with my colleagues due to recent revelations causing us to feel a little bit undervalued because we chose to teach elementary school edu physical education. My employment in Prince William County started in 2006. That school year was the first year that Virginia decided that Virginia required all elementary students to have 90 minutes of physical education in seven days. The temporary solution to that number of classes per all grade levels was double classes with six 45 minute periods a day. So comes the temporary fix. Building administrators could either hire an assistant as a second person or a second physical education teacher. Due to the budgetary concerns, all but one school out of 60 some elected to go with the assistant. This was thought to be as a temporary solution to a long-term problem. Several years later, it again, again became addressed and the solution was that to put out that teacher assistants can be with the class by themselves without the aid or without the physical education teacher as long as they were not teaching new material, just reviewing already taught material. But this does not resolve the fact that the physical education teacher is solely responsible for the education and safety of all the charged students, even when they are not in our site. My colleagues and I are not here to tell you that our teacher assistants are not valued or important to us. I have had great assistants. What we are here to say is that we feel for our students' success, it would be better to have a second physical education teacher. Students are our greatest concern. A teacher assistant are not certified to teach VA standards related to elementary physical education content. They're not schooled in proper and safe methods to instruct physical education and to quali qualitatively evaluate students' progress with movement. Preparing the, student, the teaching assistant the to teach physical education con uh, content each day takes away the time for the specialist needs to prepare for their own for the class. In some instances, the teacher assistant is a, for the physical education is the teacher or assistant from somewhere else in the building that is free for that 45 minutes. I am responsible for 780 enrolled students, double classes each period ranging from 48 to 64 students per class, twice in a six day rotation, ensuring that they meet or exceed the standards set by the Virginia Department of Education in Prince William County. This, this includes all the students with special needs and consideration, every one of them more, no more important than the other. But due to the class size of my classes, I cannot give the additional one-on-one -on -one time to each student that requires it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, Cor Corinne Hogan. And I apologize if I, if I mess up the names. My apologies. 
Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Corinne Haugen, and my address is on file. This is my eighth year teaching, physical education in Prince William County. I am here speaking on behalf of my students, my colleagues, and myself. I will be addressing the physical education program guidelines for public elementary schools created by the Virginia Board of Education, offering a solution to make improvements and sharing student experiences. Please note, these guidelines pertain to physical education, which should not be confused with physical activity. And given the working conditions provided by Prince William County Schools, it is nearly impossible to adhere to the following guidelines. Number one, schools provide adequate equipment, technology, and facilities that provide healthy, safe, active, and equitable learning experiences. Number two, students are taught by qualified health and physical education teachers who deliver instruction that supports learning for all students. Schools provide adequate facilities and equipment, adequate time for instruction, and class size that supports high quality instruction and ensures student safety. And number three, ensure students are taught by qualified health and physical education teachers. As you have heard, and will continue to hear in my colleagues' speeches, we go above and beyond for our students to provide them with endless opportunities and tools necessary to achieve physically healthy lifestyles. Our students are and will always be our first priority and the reason for our profession. It's our job as highly qualified and certified physical educators to be their voice and make sure they are receiving what they deserve. We are asking that you help us meet these guidelines little by little and over time. We ask that you please work with us to come up with a solution and plan of action that is equitable and achievable. A solution that we think is feasible is adding a second certified physical education teacher to 12 schools each year over a five-year period. The cost of this is approximately $684,000 more a year to achieve this goal that is best for the students. Lastly, my students have written letters to the school board sharing their experiences in physical education class. Their letters speak volumes in pointing out where we are falling short as a county in elementary school education due to our conditions and limitations. According to my students, we never have enough equipment. There are too many kids at once in PE. There should be less kids because it's not safe and people get hurt. I don't like the number of kids in PE because we have to squeeze in. We need more time in PE because we need to get our energy out. If elementary students can recognize our shortfalls, surely our great leaders in Prince William County can not only recognize this too, but find a way to take action for positive changes. Please join us in this journey to ensure all elementary schools have two certified physical educators, along with compensation for the numbers of classes we teach per day as our middle school and high school colleagues. Thank you for your continued support. Please fund our future. Corey Love. Good evening, Chairman Latif, Dr. Waltz, and fellow board members. My name is Corey Love, my address is on file. I spent the past seven years teaching physical education at the elementary level in Prince William County. I'm currently on my first year teaching physical education at the middle school level. My job, life are much less stressful now that I've made the switch, other than the fact I'm married in 40 days. But <laughs> I just wanted to say a few words in support of my colleagues at the elementary level. I teach approximately 300 and 60 students this year at middle school. I previously taught approximately 720 students at the elementary school. This year I received $3,000 more in compensation for teaching half the amount of students I used to. If you teach six classes with approximately 45 students in elementary and you teach six classes with approximately 45 students at middle school, you should be compensated the same. I also have more quality planning time which I am able to collaborate with five other certified physical education teachers to design and implement the best practices for our students. In conclusion, I would strongly suggest adding a second certified physical education teacher to each elementary school in order to provide a better world-class education for our students. From my personal experience, I feel that teaching middle school is more effective than teaching elementary school because of the amount of certified teachers in the gym. With more certified teachers, we've been able to provide a better differentiated instruction, as well as supportive help and immediate feedback to all our students. Eddie, another PE teacher at the elementary level is in the best interest of our students. Thank you for your time. Please fund our future. Thank you. Courtney Mann. Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Courtney Manny, and my address is on file. 
I'm here to share my experience of working in a school where the administration believes in and supports the benefit of a quality health and PE program. As stated earlier, there is only one elementary school in our district that employs two certified health and PE teachers. I am one of those two teachers. As a six-year teacher, I have the advantage of working alongside a colleague who has over 20 years of experience, and together we affect the lives of 685 students. We are able to have single classes in each of our gyms and only need to double up our kindergarten classes if needed due to weather as the main gym is used during lunch. This allows the, uh, us the opportunity to engage our students in a variety of skilled movement activities with little wait time, plenty of equipment, introduction of specialized technology, and proper assessment time, which in turn allows for effective feedback, differentiation, injury prevention, and more adequate behavior and class management. From what I can see, we, as a district, are renovating and building new schools to add more rooms for students, including more general spaces like the auxiliary gym I currently teach in. My administration looked at this space and believed they could affect positive change by adding a PE teacher, making use of that space appropriately, and addressing the needs of students, giving them what they deserve, an environment conducive to learning. Because we have two teachers, we can diversify our lessons and offer a broad range of skills and activities for our students within our curriculum and cross-curricular. Our different approaches enable us to reach our diverse population. This enables us to engage our students on a variety of levels to address the wellness of the whole child, physical, social, and mental emotional. Furthermore, much needed health-related curriculum is addressed to give our students the tools they need to make better life decisions. Yes, even at the elementary level. Additionally, we are often organizers and creators of extracurricular activities at our schools. PE teachers offer a variety of clubs before and after school and play a big role in creating family and community events, promoting physical fitness and overall wellness. Several of our elementary schools around the county offer family fitness nights, fun runs, health fairs, and bike rodeos. Lastly, we support our staff by incorporating staff wellness activities, ranging from sharing health articles from online sources or offering group exercise programs. Clearly, budgeting for two teachers is a reality. We are proof it can be done. It requires an administration that believes in the benefits of providing a quality program, and in our case, a world-class one. I have letters here from our students stating why it is important to them. Now is the time to acknowledge our dedication to our students and communities by making room in the budget for two physical education teachers and compensation for the number of classes we teach each day. Thank you for this opportunity to highlight the many ways we reach our students and beyond. Please fund our future. Patty Swanson. Good evening, Chairman Latif, board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Patty Swanson, and my address is on file. As an elementary health and physical education teacher of 31 years, 17 of them in Prince William County, I feel compelled to bring to your attention what a real kick in the gut it was for elementary physical education teachers to learn about their middle school and high school peers receiving compensation in December for their class roster sizes. Not only was the compensation disheartening, but the way it was handled in a non-transparent way seems less than world class. I am here seeking equity and respect for the job that we do every day as elementary physical educators. Understanding that this compensation was a result of a change in the law at the state level, I also understand that it would be acceptable for our county to, do, to quote, do the right thing and compensate all physical education teachers equally. In comparing average roster sizes, or roster numbers, all uh, at all three levels, you will quickly see that the elementary teachers have the larger rosters by far and are faced with teaching double classes with one certified teacher receiving zero additional compensation. In my quest to find answers regarding upper grade level compensation and the overcrowding of elementary PE classes, I came across the following information from the standards of quality guidelines stating that local school boards shall employ 
um, five full-time equivalent positions per 1,000 students in grade K through five to serve as elementary resource teachers in art, music, and physical education. It's been brought to my attention that Prince William County is in compliance with this guideline by adding all the elementary students together in the division and dividing this number by five. This allows for three resource teachers per school, whether the school has 400 students or 1,000 students. Even though I am not a math major, one can quickly see on a daily basis that this does not add up. You would experience this if you walked in our elementary PE shoes every day. Even in my, if my school obtained a second PE teacher, my roster would still be larger than my upper level peers who received additional compensation in December and will receive or additional compensation in December and will receive an additional 12,000 in the future for teaching a sixth 45 minute class, something elementary teachers do every day and have done for years with no additional compensation. At a time when new teacher hires and teacher retention rates are at an all time low, I find the conditions provided for the elementary physical education teacher and the lack of equal compensation to be major deterrents. For this reason and more, I too will become a teacher retention statistic this year. As I, as I choose retirement over fighting the system, <sighs> for what seems to be a, seems like a simple solution. I stand here on behalf of my elementary colleagues who teach their students every day that to become the best version of themselves, they must do the next right thing. I challenge you, Prince William County, to do the same. Will you please compensate all physical, physical educators equally and hire two certified physical education teachers in all elementary schools where needed? I am grateful for the opportunity to be a teacher in Prince William County for the past 17 years. I can honestly say that I have given it my all, changed and affected many lives despite the inequity in compensation and the understaffing of the elementary physical education teachers, education teachers that in the end is the greatest negative impact on our students. Please fund our future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The last three will be... Um, Catherine Lechbod, Jennifer Gilly, and Kenny Bodie. Oh, Rachel Freeman. I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah, Rachel, you're up next. So okay. My apologies. Okay. I'm here all the time, it seems like. Um, my name is Rachel Freeman, and I am um, a member of the Parents Who Care, and I'm here for Woodridge High School, and um, who are now state champs. <laughs> I just got the news. I don't know if you've heard that. They won. They won. They won. So who won? Just tell us. The won. girls. The Let girls, everyone know. Girls, girls I know that. I know. The girls okay. basketball. Woodbridge Senior High School girls varsity basketball are now the Virginia State Champions. For the first time ever. That's. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll give you 20 extra right. seconds. It's okay. It's short. Um, I'm glad I have teenagers that will text me. All right. While building an auxiliary gym is a nice gesture for Woodbridge High School, it does not bring the facilities up to the level of its high school peers. There will still only be a single indoor court in the main gym with two unusable concrete areas behind the bleachers. It will not fix the current practice scheduling complexities compared to the dividable three court plus auxiliary space in the other county schools. I'm not just talking about Colgan or Patriot. I'm talking about virtually all the high schools in the county. My greatest concern is that the proposed Band-Aid approach will be viewed as a permanent solution, which is not right. It is better to make the effort to do it right the first time and not have to revisit it. So let's do it right the first time. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine Lechbud. Hello, good evening. My name is Catherine Leckbag. My address is on file with uh, the clerk. Um, Chairman Latif, members of the board, Superintendent Waltz, ladies and gentlemen. I offer my support of the superintendent's 2020 fiscal year budget, and I urge the school board to approve the same. I stand before you as a graduate of Woodbridge Senior High School, as a mother of three children who currently attend Prince William County Schools, 
as a spouse of an employee of Prince William County Schools, and as a very proud teacher who works for Prince William County Schools. Our family represents five schools, Colgan, Independence Non-Traditional, Garfield, Woodbridge, and Lake Ridge Elementary School. I work at Independence as an ESOL teacher. I could spend plenty of time talking about class sizes and how colleagues and I at Potomac Middle School last year felt harried without adequate time to serve all students. Many times I would have a mental cue in my mind of the students who would ask for help knowing that I probably wouldn't get to all of them before the period ended. I could spend time speaking of the dire need for capital improvement at particular schools. Dare I say that I graduated from Woodbridge in 1988 and I believe the same curtains are hanging on the stage. I could spend time not only praising what Woodbridge, excuse me, praising what Prince William County Schools has done for my son, who's on the autism spectrum, but I could also talk and relay the bona fide exhaustion and frustration many of my special education colleagues feel with caseloads that are bulging at the seams. No, instead I choose to share my very personal story about how I do financially on a teacher's salary. I came to teaching later in life as a career switcher. I am typically two decades older than most of my peers, and I like to joke how I make the salary of a 20-something year old when I'm 40-something. Right now, my salary is at step five for a BA plus 15, and according to the Reston Patch News website, that's just about the average pay for a teacher in Virginia. And I even work the third shift at Independence to make more money, yet I am unable to afford my own home. You see, I am the sole breadwinner for my family. My husband currently does work at Lake Ridge Elementary School as a cafeteria worker, but he doesn't get a lot of money and there are no benefits. In fact, in the position he's in, he cannot even maintain or obtain full time. Thankfully, we are, blessed, we are blessed to be living in my father's house for a much reduced cost of living, but at 49, it truly is embarrassing to say I still live in my father's home. I've worked in several industries, and I say with the utmost seriousness, I've never seen an industry in which the most valuable asset is valued the least at least in terms of monetary pay. Virginia teachers make almost 9,000 less per year than the national average. We are ranked 34th in the nation, while Washington, D.C. is ranked 4th, and Maryland is ranked 7th. Within Northern Virginia, Prince William County Schools is one of the lowest paying districts. The urge to move is palpable. To retain and recruit high quality educators. Thank you, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you for your time. Jennifer Gilly, Gilly, Kenny Bodie. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kenny Bodie, and my address is on file. I reside in the Agaquan District. I, like many others, would first like to commend you for this budget. It puts a lot of investments where we need the most, in our educators, in mental health, in class sizes, in pre-K, and in counselors. We still have a, far, a little bit farther to go, though. We still have equity issues, such as the ones mentioned at Woodbridge Senior High. We still have some shortcomings when it comes to folks such as physical ed teachers, bus drivers, and others who we need to value just as much as everyone else. I recently was able to go to Westridge, Westridge Elementary School, which is my neighborhood school, and I was able to read to some of the students there. Um, it's, one, it's something that I recommend every single person do, and I know many of you on the board have already done that recently. Um, because when you're able to actually get in the schools, interact with children in a way that's not just sort of walking around, seeing what's going on, but actually getting there and looking at the students there, there's something magical about it. Because you see, I wasn't just looking at, you know, second graders, third graders. I was looking at our future. I was looking at literally the future of our society. I was looking at our future doctors, engineers, roboticists, artists, violinists, Yes, future school board members, future governors, and future presidents of the United States. I cannot understate that enough. 
when you are able to go into these schools and actually interact with these kids, you know that what we're fighting for during budget season aren't just numbers, aren't just theoretical, hey, this is how we can move our society forward. We are actually fighting for our future. So I say it you know, time in, time out, every time we go through budget season, I love to see these crowds, but we need every single one of these people who are here today yelling at you guys to also go to the Board of County Supervisors, because let's face it, we are putting artificial ceilings on how much we're funding our schools. That doesn't come from you guys, that comes from the McCourt building. So I will leave you all with this. We have an opportunity this year based on this really, really, really great budget to actually move the ball forward. We have an opportunity to actually invest in all the right places, but you guys need more tools to do that. We need to be able to invest more in class size reduction. We need to be able to eliminate trailers. We need to be able to do the things we need in order to make it so as we have more and more residential development that you guys fight every step of the way, which I appreciate you for, we have to keep moving forward. We still have the largest class sizes in, Virgin in Northern Virginia. We still have some of the lowest teacher pay. And to me, that's flip flops. We need to be able to move the ball forward, not just keep keeping up. So again, thank you so much. And I'll just say it again for the people in the back, fund our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There being no other citizens indicating they wish to speak on this subject, I declare the public hearing closed. Next, we'll move to um, the public meeting, the, our regular meeting. I would like to call the meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. Uh, we will first take a moment of silence um, asked for by board member Diane Ralston. Let me take a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Next, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Do I have a student who would like to come up to the podium and lead us in the pledge? Anybody, please? Please rise and the... Trace Buckley. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, next we'll go to the uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, a motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do I have Mr. a second? Chairman. Ms. Williams. A second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda, a motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Any discussion? Yes. I've... Ms. Jesse. I would like to discuss item 1410. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this particular item is, of, of course, very important to me. Uh, Woodridge High School, uh, you've heard tonight some of the concerns that we have and that we've been um, to feel that that school needed renovation. I'm really pleased to know that we are going to get a new feel. And, you know, the parents and, of course, together we've been working diligently to obtain that feel. I, tonight we are looking at the um, conversion as item as listed in 1410. Uh, many of you know that I have indicated publicly and in writing my opposition to crumb rubber. And uh, it looks like this field will have crumb rubber. And for Woodbridge High School at this late date, we really need to have the field. But I wanted the public and the board members to know that as a school system, 
we really need to look at the health considerations with this crumb rubber. When I uh, am on this board, you know, my background is is in data analysis, and I always talk about things like meta-analysis and this kind of thing. But when you look at, you don't need a meta-analysis to know that children should not be uh, allowed to be on a field where these tiny beads of black uh, beads can get in their nostrils, in, in their throats. And so as we look down the road, I will continue my fight. I will vote for the consent agenda but I will continue to my fight for the school system to look at healthier fields and healthier turfs. Uh, we can't wait until something happens. And I know that the research is kind of sketchy, but there's research that says we need to be concerned about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there has been a lot of discussion, a lot of research on the topic of turf fields. I just want to point out to the public that uh, New York City, um, numerous jurisdictions have done detailed investigative uh, reports. Uh, this is something that has not been done lightly. Um, the health implications have been um, very aggressively reviewed numerous times by multiple different jurisdictions. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that the board is going to uh, unanimously move forward as we continue to improve our schools. Uh, Mr. Wilk. On another completely different note, um, I just want to recognize uh, National Autism Awareness Month um, as the father of a child on the autism spectrum, uh, receiving services from our school system and other providers. Um, I just want to recognize that and all the families out there uh, with children who have special needs somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and. Uh, this is an um, important month to reflect and, again, continue to advocate for more programs and better services as best we can uh, for our students with special needs. Mr. Trenum. I'll jump in. Just uh, I want to point out that one of the, res one of the um, resolutions is this is the month of the military child. So we have that, and uh, I'll, I'll plug my, fa my new favorite charity, or militarytokids.com. It was a, it's a great way to help uh, deploying, deploying uh, soldiers and sailors and take, help them take care of their kids. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. So at this time, I chatted with the, some of the school board members earlier. If there's no opposition, I'd like to change the order of the agenda. Um, I'd like to bring forward, it would be um, 1701 school naming, Prince William Parkway Elementary School. Um, do I have any objections to move it forward? Okay. Um, and we, we decided we would, it would be a good idea to move it forward just in the interest of time. And then also point out that um, citizen-wise, there was no one speaking on this topic except one who I got approval for, if that was okay to move it. So, um, Ms. Jesse, we're going to be naming the Prince William Parkway Elementary School in the Occoquan District. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I recommend that we name the, the, new, the Prince William County Parkway Elementary School John Jenkins Elementary. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. Ms. Jesse. When um, Mr. Jenkins passed away, I wrote a special tribute, and I'd like to read that, but I want to say in advance that this is the first school in my district. And I want to thank Ruth Anderson. She and I have been working long and hard to, f to build a school, looking for space. And the fact that this particular school is on the parkway, it's in the Occoquan District, but it is directly across the street from John Jenkins' home. I couldn't believe this. And I had mentioned the name of John Jenkins, and we talked about the magisterial district and my magisterial district at the end of the day. Um, it's all about your contributions to this county. 
regardless of your background, regard, regardless of your magisterial district. Uh, I'd just like to read this personal tribute, which Ms. Jenkins has, that, has this uh, tribute. I said, when we think of political leaders' awards, a community servant, an advocate, avid supporter, et cetera, come to mind. When you think of John Jenkins, the word an institution is much more fitting. Some call him Mr. Dale City, but most simply call him John. There was also a very, friend, a very frequently heard, there was also the very frequently heard John and Ernie when introductions were made. You see, they were one and the same. You rarely saw one without the other. John was a fixture in the community. He was a quiet giant man who sought little, if anything, in return. No event was too small for him to attend. Sometimes he sought the physical support and aid of others to enter the arena, but he was always there. I was a neophyte when it came to politics when I entered the race, so I was honored that he and, yes, Ernestine, took me under their wings. She invited me to lunch and gave me the following piece of advice. Some politicians believe in door-to-door -door campaigns. Johnny, the name she perfectly called him, and I believe in people-to-people. -people. It, it was not unusual to see them at public events seated among large and small crowds. He loved his community and was committed to the growth of all Prince William, but dedicated to the life of Dale City. The people will miss this very dedicated servant who served them even during times of personal, physical pain and distress. They will applaud him for his numerous contributions. Few of us will achieve his legacy of giving during our lifetime. My sorority, the Prince William County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated and I, are the founders of the Martin Luther King Youth Oratorical Contest. Next year will be the 30th anniversary of this nationally recognized program. Few people know that it was John Jenkins who was responsible for establishing our partnership with Hilton Chapel. The program needed a, a much larger venue to house its standing room only attendance. In fact, it is now one of the largest MLK celebrations in the nation. Thousands attend annually. Locally, it, become, it has become an annual family reunion. Persons from every arena in the, in the community attend to include educators, businessmen, business owners, local community organizations, religious leaders, and most importantly, our little ones and our youth. John was the first recipient of the Martin Luther King Drum Major Award for his support of MLK. He proudly wore his medal to each program. He never missed a program until this year. You will always see him, and you always saw him in the crowd of thousands. That was not unusual when you remember that John and Ernie are people to people leaders. It is an honor for me to have an opportunity to just be with Ernestine and John Jenkins and to have a school in my district named in his honor is one of the best things that could have happened. Thank you very much. I'll take a quick second here to just say, as we, before Mr. Jenkins passed away, Supervisor Jenkins, um, you know, we put a committee together to have the naming. And Ms. Jesse and Ms. Ralston were the first to put Mr. Jenkins' name on the list as one of the options. And this is two months ago. This is before Mr. Jenkins passed away. And it was a great idea then. Um, Mr. Jenkins passed away just a couple weeks ago, and it's a better idea now. Um, I can tell you that universally, every board member that I talk to up here, every county board of supervisor that I talk to, every delegate and elected official, every one of my patients who lives in the Absco and in Prince William County 
have voiced concerns and emails and thoughts that this should be the name of the elementary school at the corner of Prince William Parkway and Old Bridge Road um, near the Chin Center. And so I, if the board member would accommodate me because I think this is something that I think comes from the entire board. Um, does everyone have a copy of a resolution? Um, that we have here. So I, 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 there's a number of whereas statements, and I'm going to read the first one, and if then Ms. Allison Satterway can read the second one, and Mr. Trenum the third, and we go down the roll. Um, whereas John D. Jenkins was born on July 21, 1939, to Reuben, Frank, and Frank Louise Jenkins in Geneva, Alabama, and Ms. Satterway. And whereas John, G, John D. Jenkins proudly served his country as a veteran of the U.S. Army, where he served two tours in Vietnam, earned the Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Cluster, and retired as Lieutenant Colonel after a distinguished 24-year career. And whereas John D. Jenkins and his beloved wife, Ernestine Stewart Jenkins, settled in Dale City in 1973 and raised a loving and devoted family of three sons, Warren, Mark, and Gordon, 14 grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren. Whereas John D. Jenkins served our community with honor, integrity, and unparalleled com uh, commitment to his constituents, earned the distinguished, where am I, sorry, um, where am I, distinction of the longest serving member of the, in the history of the Prince William County Board of Supervisors. Uh, having, having been appointed in 1982 to, the, uh, to fill the Neabsco district seat vacated by James J. McCourt and subsequently elected by the people of the Neabsco district in early election, in every election following and and whereas John D. Jenkins worked tirelessly to improve the lives of the citizens he served and was critical in building and supporting many civic organizations, including the Dale City Civic Association, the Prince William Boys and Girls Club, Potomac Rappahannock Transportation Commission, Virginia Association of Counties, uh, Virginia Railway Express, and VFW Post 1503, and he was 33rd degree Freemason and Whereas John D. Jenkins was instrumental in the construction of hundreds of public work, works projects, including the Prince William Parkway, Dale City Recreation Center, the James J. McCourt Administration Building, the G. Richard Feisner Stadium, the Hildebarg Homeless Prevention Center, the Garfield Police Station, the Chin Park Regional Library and Fitness Center, the Freedom Aquatic Center, and other roads, parks, libraries, fire stations, and schools, and Whereas John D. Jenkins was very supportive of students and schools within Prince William County, attending numerous school and division events, as well as personally recognizing the individual achievements of thousands of students and. Whereas John D. Jenkins passed away on February 6, 2019. Jesse. Okay. Therefore, now therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County, Prince William County School Board names the Prince William Parkway Elementary School to John D. Jenkins Elementary School. Please vote. We have to vote. We have to vote. Please vote. Please vote. I'll ask the vote is eight yes unanimous. Motion passed. Very good. I'm going to ask the board members to come down in the front and take a picture with Ms. Jenkins, if they don't mind. If the board members can come down to the front, please accommodate this request right up front. And then, Ms. Jenkins, would you like to say a couple words? Yes, ma'am. Well, why don't we have you do that first, and we'll then take the picture. Okay.
God is good. That's all I can say. It is an awesome night, awesome night. I just wanted to say a couple of things to you all because I just praise God for you. And I know John is looking down from heaven and saying, why me? And I know why, why him, because these are the things that I found out about him. You know, 60 years is a long time to live with someone and to love them every single day, almost. <laughs> First, my family and I would like to express our love and gratitude to all of you. I just want you to know I love every one of you for your commitment to John Jenkins and to our entire community for the outpouring kindness and honor that you've shown to my family, our family, John and my family. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, I'm just a little nervous. Uh, my husband, as you know, he, he was so honored to be a part. I think his love for children sometimes just, uh, just amazed me how he would go into the elementary schools and, and decide one day that he's going to Dell City or one of the schools somewhere and read to the children. I have a picture, in fact, I wish I'd shown, brought it to share with you. But he enjoyed being, and he, I think his heart was to be a public servant from the day I married him at 18 years old. Among the many things that John was passionate about was the future of our children and their education. He devoted much of his time to making our school system the best that it can be and always putting the students his number one priority. All of the members of our family greatly, greatly appreciate the honor that you've bestowed upon our loving husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. The John D. Jenkins Elementary School, we know this will be a wonderful part of his legacy as he stays alive in Prince William County and in Dale City. Thank you all for your love and support. You just have no idea what it does to my heart. I love you all. Thank you. Could I ask all of John and Ernestine's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, granddaughter-in-laws, grandson-in-laws, and all you people. Come on. Please come because you're a special part of this for your granddaddy. Up there. Up there.
see us? I don't know. Are we in the picture up here? Yeah, we are. You're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You're too, not, too, not. You're too short. I'm too short. Oh. Maybe we should put. Maybe we should go back up front because some of us are not. Oh, sit. Let's see. Oh, you can't. Well, let's see. Sit. <laughs> That's all right. Everybody squeeze in between the head. There. Okay, there you go. You should tweet that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Oh, you're the preacher, right? No, ma'am. Which one is the preacher? Thank you, sir. The, the rebel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone for accommodating us on that very special moment. Um, we're gonna go next to the comments from our student representative. During this time on the agenda, the student rep and the alternates will speak and have an opportunity to introduce themselves and share their interests. Mr. Uh, Sasan Faraj. Hey everyone, it's good to see you all today. Uh, within the past few weeks, students have accomplished great things across the county. As mentioned, <clears throat> as mentioned before, I planned the first meeting between all the high school's SCA presidents with the county and all but one attended. Uh, there were two main reasons why I wanted to start this. The first is intra-county communication and the promotion of school spirit. Throughout the year, student leaders voiced the desire to promote communication between schools in order to enhance their own school spirit. And this can be viewed as a student-directed student alternative to promoting a welcoming educational environment. And by giving each SCA the opportunity of voicing their perspective at this meeting, they are able to share ideas with each other on how they can each promote school spirit within their individual school. The second re uh, reason for this meeting is to build a foundation for future student representatives to have a point of connection, a point of contact within each school. It is also an efficient way to hear from the elected representatives from each school at one time. And since the February 13th meeting, which was the first meeting, uh, this meeting has occurred three times, each more productive than the last. During the first meeting, many goals were drawn out. The f uh, most important one was the idea to work with the special education departments with each of the high schools, within each of the high schools, to create a unified prom. To preface, a few of the schools already ha have what is called a unified prom, which is a prom made to incorporate kids within the special education department. This event is held in addition to the senior junior prom for these schools, and each one has great success. So the presidents decided to try and make this into a countywide event. After working with their respective schools, it is clear that this this is an idea that is favored by both the special education teachers and students within the county. Now that we have the date reserved, at, um, the unified prom will occur on May 11th at the Kelly Leadership Center from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, obviously, more details are to come as the students are working tirelessly to piece together the last bits of the details, and thankfully there will be more meetings for these students to engage, uh, exchange ideas. I would like to extend my thanks to the Office of Risk Management and the Office of Student Services for all the help along the way. Apart from this meeting, I have been able to make my journey back through the rest of the high schools. Recently, I had the honor of visit, revisiting Garfield High School's SCA. Apart from what was brought up during the la my last visit there, the students focused their time on two aspects of their education. The student leaders suggested that the pathway to withdrawing from an advanced level class within the beginning of the year or class changes in general should be more clear. Many, students uh, many times, students find themselves in a lot of confusion during the beginning of the year when they are not allowed to withdraw from a class in which they might not succeed later on. In this case, students believe that this process should be clearly laid out and readily available to the students. And in the spirit of today's public hearing on the budget proposal, the students did have one suggestion for the schools going forward. Uh, the students believe that schools should allocate more funding or attention at the least towards non-traditional sports like rowing or bowling as mentioned in the last board meeting. This would help give more students a competitive edge if they dis uh, decide to apply towards more competitive schools. Also, also it would allow uh, for students to explore different sports that they may not have 
already been uh, available for them. Uh, lastly, the students believe that schools should encourage teachers to incorporate more pieces of literature or works of other cultures in order to broaden the cultural awareness within the classroom, specifically emphasizing teaching more about African American history outside of African American History Month in order to diversify the curriculum. When I asked the students what they appreciated about their education, they responded with culture and di diversity. They appreciate that although the students are diverse in ethnicity and culture, they have one overall spirit as a school. School spirit like that is what goes on to create a welcoming learning environment. Now on this board meeting's uh, student representative edition of the student spotlight, I would like to acknowledge the two seniors from Brentsville High School and two fifth graders from Bristol Run Elementary School who placed as winners in this year's Youth Art Month flag contest. For the high school level, senior Anna Menzel placed first and Ellen Poland placed fourth. On the elementary level, Olivia Kim won first and Marcus Burleson won second. Good job guys, I'm proud of you. Next stop on my visits, I will visit uh, Brentsville Student Government Association on March 13th and the SCA president will have their next meeting on the 18th. And as always, students can reach me at my Prince William County given email. I'll spell it out. F-A-R-A-J-S-A-19 at pwcs-edu.org. Thank you. Thank you, son. Next, we'll move to citizens' comments. Um, here's where we talk about the citizen comments on the agenda and non-agenda items. It looks like that we have today. Um, pull that list. Um, we will have... Nine people, um, eight or nine, um, who um, signed up to speak. Everyone that signed up will get a chance to speak. If we are, uh, well, that's it. We'll have you'll have three minutes to speak, and the clerk will keep the time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify that you should sum up your position. Red indicates your time is up. You should stop. Please use proper decorum manners while at the podium. If you do not do so, you'll be asked to step aside. Please give your name, address for the record when you approach the podium. Uh, if you can come up to the front, Stacy Booker. Laron Hinton, Dr. Alice Howard, Christine Makatshavili, Richard Jesse, Riley O'Casey, Joseph George, Chrissy Falls, Victor Angry. And Stacy Booker. You're next. Good evening, Chairman Latif, uh, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. As an active person in your community, and especially as a school board member, it doesn't take long for you to notice the same people at different functions that you attend throughout the county. A lot of those same people are parents of student athletes, and most of the time they have more than one child. There's usually that one year when their children are split between two different schools, like a middle school and a high school. I'm asking this evening that you consider combining the middle school and high school parent-student mandatory concussion training and replace the PowerPoint presentation with a student written performed and directed movie through our school system's media services and perhaps some funding from Sparks. The severity of a concussion is not based on an age. It does not discriminate. So there isn't a reason to have them separated. When you address the many levels of comprehensions of our families, you do need to have a program that is based on a sixth grade level. The movie coincides with the division's awareness and training of visual and audio inclusion to our families. What is now a tedious task can turn into a family fun night that even keeps the drag preschooler entertained. I'm a mother of four student athletes at one time having a student at each level, elementary, middle school, and high school. My oldest had to come home from college with post-concussion syndrome. So the story goes beyond trying to have these combined as a convenience. I picked a broken child up from college. He was a changed person from that point on. He had played sports all his life, enjoyed school, and enjoyed great informative conversations. And now he was a quick, angered person that said he was never going to play sports again and could not complete a conversation, let alone continue his education. With time and a lot of work, he eventually was able to resume college on a lacrosse scholarship, continuing to break school goal records. He graduates in 2019, and he currently travels to develop and works with various programs to introduce, introduce youth to lacrosse. I may have many more ideas. I would like to be a part of concussion awareness and avoidance with Prince William County Public Schools. Thank you to all of you that put in the time into making a better place for our next generation. Thank you to Mr. Fred Milbert, Supervisor of Student Activities prior to his retirement and his replacement, Mr. Kelly Gardner, for entertaining my questions on concussions and sharing the continuous plans on protecting our student athletes. And thank you to the school board for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you to my daughter, Aaliyah, whose birthday is today and allows me to come and speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Laron Hinton. 
Good evening. That's, that's my mother. All right. Uh, good morning. Oh, good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Walt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So good evening. My name is Laron Hen. Today, I wanted to highlight a matter that is quite personal to me, concussions. Thank you, Prince William County Schools, for holding concussion training as they are a serious matter. In this short time, I'll to tell you my story in hopes for a better understanding of the effects of concussions. <clears throat> in 2012, I suffered a concussion in college playing lacrosse. At that time, concussions were not such a big deal as they are now. So I didn't really understand what was going on with me. I had constant headaches, mood swings, a loss of interest with things I love, and problems trying to think. As the days passed, my concussions didn't improve. I had what I know now as PCS, and that's post-concussive syndrome. At this time, I could barely formulate a sentence or articulate a meaningful conversation. In addition, my memory was horrible. I could be talking to my mother and completely forget what we were talking about. Due to these effects, I had to drop out of college. I used this time for brain rest, doctor visits, and counseling. Finally, after getting over that hump with time, I enrolled back in college. I am now completing my last semester in college and finished my lacrosse season as one of the top D2 lacrosse players in the nation. Uh, being that I overcame adversity, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Being that I overcame adversity others have not, I wanted to share my experience so that others may understand and take the necessary steps to now let PCS defeat them. So again, thank you for um, concussion awareness and please let's keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alice Howard. Good evening, board members and Dr. Walsh. My name is Alice H. Howard and I reside at 16654 Mallory Court, Dumfries, Virginia. The National Coalition of 100 Black Women Prince William County Chapter, Inc., is here tonight to dis discuss our 2019 legislative agenda. We want to share with you what we shared with the legislators down in Richmond, Virginia. In CBW's trip to Legislative Day at the Capitol in Richmond, Virginia on Tuesday, February 12th, 2019 was very productive. Our major goal was to seek additional funding for our students in Prince William County and Stafford County Schools. Due to the leadership, guidance, and support of Delegate Luke E. Torian, we were able to meet face-to-face -face with both House members and Senate members to present our legislative issues. In Virginia, we suffer a severe shortage of mental health supervisors and guidance counselors. We suffer a, mental, a shortage for uh, to meet the needs of our students. Over half of the counties in Virginia do not have a child adolescence mental health professional in their school. And one in five children has a diagnosis of mental disorder. One in 10 suffer a series of mental health challenges. Many of these children have nowhere to go for medical assistance. A medical health services in the 21st Century Joint Subcommittee has been established to keep the topic on the front of the table. Our goals were several. Number one, to continue to advocate on behalf of women of color and girls on the topic of mental health. To articulate to school board superintendents in CBW's major focus areas and to share with our legislators, both in the House and the Senate, our issues that we wanted to address. To discuss key issues on mental health, we discussed the following. We want support to, for the integration of mental health services in middle schools in Prince William County. Increase funding in Prince William County and Stafford County for our middle school and high schools. There is a critical shortage of licensed mental health professionals in our school. Provide additional funding for guidance counselors, social workers, psychologists, and teachers. Provide additional funding to train new employees as well as veteran staffs in job performance. Strengthen our mental health educators and professionals in our middle school and to acknowledge and help stop the stigma on this topic. I know my time is running out, but before I introduce the ladies, uh, Dr. Walsh, I know you have an excellent grant writing 
department. Look in your folder. We have all kinds of money available to, uh, for school divisions to apply for. 2.6 million was in the General Assembly account, 4.5 million federal Medicaid, and on and on. Thank you so very much. All of the coalition sisters that are left, please stand. Thank you. Christine Machiavelli. Machiavelli. No. No, not even close. <laughs> Just say no, you're an idiot, Dr. Lazeev. Go ahead. Hello, everyone, or Gamar Joba. That's how we say hello in my country. My name is Christine Machiavelli. Oh, wow. And I'm an exchange student from the Republic of Georgia attending Hilton High School. I want to thank Prince William County Schools for the opportunities they have provided me and other exchange students. I'm having a great year experiencing life as a teenager and seeing many uh, historic and educational events. I'm enjoying this little program and I just started playing lacrosse, which we do not have in Georgia. Uh, I have provided you a recipe of Georgian traditional food called khachapuri. I just won a nationwide competition with this recipe, and my parents were very proud and happy. Madoba, that's how we say thank you in my country. Go Bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Jesse. Good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, and members of the board. My address is on file. Please be clear that the, the following comments are my views and not, necessary, not necessarily those of Mrs. Jesse. I will admit that I have lobbied hard for her to vote no to any contract that will use chrome rubber. Dr. Waltz likes to say that he will do whatever the board wishes. What he doesn't necessarily say, and perhaps doesn't know, is that his staff can manipulate things that make it nearly impossible for the board not to do what the school staff wants in some cases. A prime example of this is the issue of contracting this evening for the two turf field, in my opinion. The board voted in 2018-19 budget for the two fields. Mrs. Jesse brought up her concerns last summer, not just recently, as some have indicated. We realized that there were not enough votes on the board to reverse this. I am alleging that the delay to bring the contract up for a vote in March was not an accident and was not caused by Mrs. Jesse. The decision to add only two types of fill, one chrome rubber and another one, was deliberate. First, listening to only one alternative to the current rubber, rubber fill isn't opening up the solicitation uh, if, if for progress. Second, the bid was issued so that the lowest bid had to be accepted, which most likely immediately ruled out anything other than chrome rubber. The solicitation could have read, a best value award will be made based on price and other consideration. Third, the issue of the first solicitation with the fill as a subcontract was most likely done knowing that it would cause a delay since most of the prime contractors would not want to bid on a combined package. Both schools want new fills sooner rather than later. Not having the fill available for graduation at Woodbridge is a source of major parent complaints. The vast majority of parents do not have kids that will be impacted one way or the other by a chrome rubber fill, so parent support for a different fill is lacking. The coaches and administration of Woodbridge High School have caved in to the bullying to accept what purchasing are giving them to go another year without or go another year without a, a usable field. Months ago, five board members could have insisted on a safer surface. You have been warned of the potential danger of the chrome rubber, 
and you can dispute it like many people did about cigarettes. After you, but now I ask you, are you going to continue to look the other way or will you prevent the dangers in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Riley O'Casey. Good evening again, uh, Chairman Latif, board members, Dr. Waltz. My name is Riley O'Casey and I'm the president of the Prince William Education Association. This part, I bring you great news to the division and the school board. In honor of Dr. Seuss's birthday and Read Across America, the Prince William Education Association donated funds to 26 elementary schools and three middle schools. Our support of Prince William County Schools will allow these 29 schools to purchase books for thousands of students that might not have had the opportunity to acquire books. I spent the last two days delivering checks to all 29 schools. Uh, and the joy and, and excitement on the students' faces were perfect, picture perfect. The following schools received the donations, Bel Air, Belmont, Dale City, Dumfries, Ellis, Enterprise, Featherstone, Fitzgerald, Carydale, Kilby, Loch Lomond, Marumsco Hills, McCulloch, Miniville, Mullen, Neabsco, Occoquan, Potomac View, River Oaks, Sinclair, Sudley, Swans Creek, Triangle, Vaughan, Westgate, and Yorkshire Elementaries, and Fredlin, Hampton, and Stonewall Middle. Please check out our Facebook page for the photos. PWEA also supports our members by offering classroom instructional grants. This year, six educators won up to $250 to provide extra resources for their students. I would like to publicly congratulate the following members. Melanie Costa from Potomac Senior High School. She will be using a document camera to increase her students' skills. Karen Levitt from P Buckland Mills Elementary will be using Osmo, I have no idea what that is, to support stream and writing skills. Mallory Joyner and Jamila Darwish from Woodbridge Senior High School will help their students start a small business by creating and selling autism awareness t-shirts. Angela Stouffer from Marsteller Middle School is creating circuit wizardry in her fax classes. Katie Searer and Carolyn McNeil from Penn Elementary are providing mini trampolines for their students with autism. I'm visiting there tomorrow. I may jump on the trampoline. And Tessa Swigger from Buckland Mills Elementary is creating independent work centers for her students with autism. Thank you for allowing me to share this news. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph George. Good evening, Chairman Latif, Dr. Waltz, school board members. My name is Joseph George, and my information is on file with the clerk. Um, many of you know me and know the various roles that I've had in the county, um, but I'm actually in front of you today as a uh, board of directors member for the Prince William Girls Fast Pitch Softball League. Um, Prince William Girls Fast Pitch Softball is a volunteer-based recreational league serving Prince William County and the surrounding areas. PWGFS is a USA softball sanctioned league and uh, we accept all girls from ages five to 18, regardless of their skill level. We are proud to offer both spring and fall seasons as well as winter clinics and summer camps for our girls. Our volunteer coaches are certified and background checked through the ACE Coach Certification Program they must also take online concussion training, um, as this young gentleman uh, here uh, can attest to, and my daughter has actually suffered from three concussions as well. Um, and uh, our coaches are volunteers throughout the community. Some of our coaches have actually remained in our league after their daughters have gone on to high school and college. Um, all of our generous volunteers are dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of fast pitch softball, as well as the skills that could lead to making their middle school or high school team, and quite possibly a college scholarship. 
We strive to offer positive, safe, fun environment for our girls and is uh, following the values of sportsmanship, teamwork, and most of all, again, as a father of three girls, confidence and pride in themselves. Uh, although not every child has a desire to play at the higher level, uh, PWGFS provides a positive, healthy, fun outlet uh, in their childhood and teen development. I've been associated with this league uh, for about nine years now, half of which has been on the board of directors. Um, I invite all of you to come out to our opening day on the 6th of April. Uh, opening ceremonies will start at 12 o'clock. Um, I encourage everyone to, to come uh, interact uh, with the crowd. We have anywhere from 150 to 200 people that show up. Um, Ms. Williams uh, was, was very gracious uh, to come to our opening ceremony last year. Um, she got to throw out one of our first pitches along with her son attached squarely to her hip. Um, and hopefully you got a little bit better to throw a better pitch this year. Um, but, but again, in closing, I invite all of you to come on out uh, to enjoy some festivities. Thank you. Thank you. Chrissy Falls. Good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, school board. I'm here to talk about internet safety. And no, not the Momo challenge. You're welcome. Um, we will be having, with, hosting with um, Allison Satterwhite and the Prevention Alliance of Greater Prince William, as well as Y Incorporated. We will be having an internet safety night at Battlefield High School, March 18th. Doors open at 6.30. Um, our speakers will be uh, local police department with Homeland Security with, on Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Probably everybody in this room, we grew up with three sources of influence, our home, our school, and our community. And now with the internet, that is a whole different ball game. You know, when we prepare our kids to go to the mall by themselves or go out in public, it's the stranger, stranger danger. None of us have lived this world that our children are living. And in order to keep them safe, we've got to enter that world a little bit, not take the phones away, but educate them so that they're safe. There are many, many evil, evil things happening on the internet, and extortion is the biggest one. We wanna keep our babies safe. We wanna be able to send them out on the internet and do the TikTok videos without being approached. It's a really cute app. Um, so I, you know, I invite you to come out. The flyers will go out this evening. Um, we've gotten great response on social media, but please come out if you can, it's Monday. March 18th at 6.30, we will have lots of resource tables available with information on anything you could need in this county. The local resources will be there. Um, but you will all get an, a special invitation when I get home and pull the flyer. Um, but please come out and support and learn yourself on this amazing thing called the internet. Thank you. Victor Angry. I guess that would be the best for last, right? Is that what that is? Good evening, uh, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, fellow board members. My name is Victor Angry, and my address is on file. <laughs> I just really want to commend you uh, all today for uh, naming the school John Jenkins School. As you read and we've heard, John Jenkins has given 60 years of his life to public service and serving others. And that, that's, over three-fourths of his life, which is incredibly uh, incredible. I want to say, I just want to tell you a quick story that I heard, and I think it's really good to go with the record of naming this school. And it was actually a story that Mr. Al Brooks told me. You know, I know he's another legend in Prince William County. In 1970, somewhere around that time, three gentlemen came and knocked on his door, and they were canvassing. These gentlemen were Mr. McCourt, Mr. Fitzner, and Mr. Jenkins. And as we see, Mr. McCourt has the McCourt building, Mr. Fitzner had the stadium, and what a very appropriate gesture to name a school after John Jenkins, because as we know, schools are where seeds are planted. And for those of us that know John Jenkins, you know that he was a, a giant that planted seeds. And so I want to do this on behalf of John Jenkins and salute you, because I know that Colonel Jenkins today would not, because service doesn't come with reward. We do it because we serve. So thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. And there was one, I, I think you did cross it off the list, but is Ethan Seacrest still here? Okay. All right. Um, next, we will move on to, um, we're going we're gonna to go to superintendent's time. Thank you, Chairman Latif and members of the board. I'd first like to begin tonight with a brief remarks to two distinguished gentlemen who recently passed away. County Supervisor John Jenkins and former school board member John Harper both had a passion and a love for our country, our community, and our students. I think it is important to thank, honor, and recognize both Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Harper for their dedication to our schools. I can't think of a much better way to do that than naming, which we have done for both of these gentlemen. I also send my condolences to their families and to their friends. On a different note, I would like to congratulate Nathaniel Provencio and the staff, students, and community at Miniville Elementary School. Miniville Elementary School has earned the International 2019 to 4 Award by Solution Tree. This is a prestigious and highly sought award presented to schools who have successfully demonstrated how professional learning communities positively impact student achievement. We are currently in the process of taking steps to share this successful program in our other schools in the division, many of whom have it now. Congratulations. Congratulations also to Drew Miller, turf grass management program educator at Brentsville District High School. He and his students have earned a second national award for the turf grass program at Brentsville District High School. Pioneer Athletics has named Brentsville's ball field a national field of excellence. Last November, the Sports Turf Managers Association bestowed its highest honor on the Brentsville, Brentsville field. Congratulations to Mr. Miller and Brentsville District High School for an outstanding turf grass establishment and maintenance program. So let me just say right now that we have a lot of different advocates for different kinds of fields and talk about a natural field. Um, we are so proud of Brentsville's field and the students that are a part of that program over there uh, working with Drew, the national recognition that they've received and that school and even some college fields, uh, they swear by, by natural grass fields. Bermuda, I think, is the actual grass that they use. So um, we're, we're pleased to accommodate that as well. I would also like to recognize Wayne Mallard, John Wallingford, and all the members of the Finance Department for receiving the 2018-2019 Meritorious Budget Award from the Association of School Business Officials International. The Meritorious Budget Award recognizes the school division's 2018-2019 school year approved budget document for excellence in preparation and issuance of its school system's budget. PWCS has won this award for 23 consecutive years. Congratulate, we can applaud that too, yeah. Right. Congratulations to Amy Hickey, Supervisor of Mathematics, her staff, many of our mathematics teachers, and high school volunteers for the coordination of a successful PWCS MathQuest. 14 schools and 120 students participated in this competitive event. Thank you, Dr. Latif, for attending and delivering encouraging words to our students. Sydney Jordan, a 2015 graduate of Stonewall Jackson High School, has been named co-winner of the 2019 Moses Taylor Payne Honor Prize from Princeton University. This award, which recognizes excellent scholarship, strength of character, and effective leadership is the highest general distinction conferred upon a Princeton undergraduate. 
A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of joining other members of the superintendent staff in a meeting with Riley O'Casey of the Prince William Education Association and Tracy Bailey of Virginia Professional Educators at the Freedom High School Bistro and Bakery. Thank you to Ms. O'Casey, Mr. Bailey, Principal Inez Bryant, Marilyn Austin, Joni Griffin, teachers of the students with special needs, and the outstanding students who prepared and served a fantastic meal for us. So just a couple of other quick things I'm going to add in here since we're deeply in the middle of the budget season and we've heard more about that tonight. I just want to remark that um, we are coming out of a very long stretch of budget challenges due to the Great Recession. And we are not alone. Every school system in the United States of America went through a very difficult time. And quite frankly, there were a lot of things that were sort of put on hold. We were trying to keep all of our employees. We didn't lay off anyone during that time. We tried our very best to give a raise. We gave a raise every year but one of that great recession. And for the first time in a decade, we have a more substantial amount of money. The challenge is there are so many competing interests for that money. And I recognize that, our staff recognizes that, the school board recognizes that. So I do have to say, I remember the first year I was here, I uh, inherited Dr. Kelly's budget, and it was outstanding. I had one budget that I was able to work with staff and formulate after that, before the Great Recession hit. That was a fantastic budget. Uh, we were able to do some significant things that year. One was we put full day kindergarten in every school. We doubled the instructional time for children in their first year of public education. Now we have some preschool programs as well, but that was huge to be able to do that. Something else we did that year that I championed, and the, re the reason I remember this well is because I got in a little bit of trouble with one board member by the name of Betty Covington, who uh, she, uh, she, she wouldn't hesitate to let me know if she thought I had not done something quite right. And she was a wonderful contributor to our school division as well, and, and uh, still living in Dumfries. But uh, it became very important to lead expanding the physical education that we were providing for students at the elementary level. And we actually added a section of physical education um, and the funding for what some people talked about, the teaching assistants, and were able to put into our rotation of music um, and, and PE, art, that sort of thing at the elementary level to give common planning time to our teachers and to also give our students more physical education. So I'm very interested in the concerns that were raised by the people who spoke and normally I don't say anything about people who speak. Um, I, you know, everybody has the right to speak. But I do have to say that uh, I think there's a point to what they're suggesting. Um, I will go back with the staff. I have already talked to our board officers at agenda planning, which was earlier tonight. I'm going to have a formal item on the next agenda that is going to read the superintendent requests, the school board's approval to have staff conduct an internal study regarding current elementary physical education staffing, which would include input from the current elementary physical education staff. So um, I'm going to champion that myself. We also will have a budget work session tomorrow night. You're all invited, 6 p.m. At that particular uh, budget work session, we will also give the current update of the state budget. Um, there's always tweaks that happen when the budget is finally approved at the state, and uh, we have some reductions. So. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to make things uh, work in that. Um, uh, we have a little bit of good news from the county side uh, as well, so we'll take a look at all of that. But we'll see if there's anything else that we can do to uh, jumpstart some of these concerns with physical education staff. And finally, uh, just a couple other quick things. One is, um, you know, we're, we've tried to expand our, the turf fields little by little. 
And we have a few fields that are left, and some may want to remain uh, Bermuda. I don't know if Brentsville would be interested in converting that since they're the champions of the United States, but uh, we're going to take a look at those other fields as well. Uh, again, I want to congratulate Woodbridge. Uh, the Woodbridge defeated Cosby 64 to 43 oh, yeah. to claim to claim that was tonight to claim the Class Six State Girls Basketball title. Region Player of the Year, Aaliyah Pitts scored her 1,000th wow. point tonight. And the Lady Vikings won the AAA six state championships. So that is phenomenal. And before I, before I close, I want to congratulate the Woodbridge High School. Um, well, this is what I've just done. But I, I wanted to <laughs> but I wanted to mention that they were at the Siegel Center at VCU. That's where they, um, that's where they played this game tonight that they became the cha state champs. So... We're very excited. Sorry, so many things, but it's all good and it's all excited. Thank Outstanding, you. Mr. Superintendent, Dr. Waltz, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to board matters, but I'm gonna sneak in a little quick surprise here. We, we were supposed to do this a couple weeks ago, but Dr. Waltz decided to code red us. Um, the Virginia, this is, um, I, I, I wanna say this, and this is from all, all of us. The Virginia School Board Association Board of Directors has designated, had designated the third week in February, which happens to be the week, um, the Virginia School Board Association Clerk Appreciation Week. With a goal of building awareness of the role of school board clerks, the, the, the role they play in assisting school board members, superintendents in our local schools. So on behalf of the Prince William County School Board, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize two outstanding ladies, please stand, who work diligently to help each member of our school board, Debbie Urban, Please stand, Ms. Debbie Urban, and B. Simpson, our deputy clerk and uh, clerk of the school board and deputy clerk, uh, who work tirelessly to ensure our needs are met. And we didn't think he cared tirelessly to ensure our needs are met from scheduling meetings to sending us multiple reminders about items we need to complete. We can depend on Ms. Urban and Ms. Simpson to take care of each of our board members. In observance of School Board Clerk Appreciation Week, I wanna thank them both for their time, their dedication, their commitment to the Prince William County Public Schools and the School Board. So thank you both very much for putting up with all of us. Thank you. Yeah, outstanding. So next, we're going to move. Dr. Latte. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Waltz. Yes, since I since I got a smackdown on that snow day, and let me just say I invite my Twitter followers, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a Twitter flex right now because I topped eighteen thousand. Um, so be careful about those snow day comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to go on record that I recognize the clerk and the deputy clerk at the meeting before the canceled yeah. meeting. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. That's right. That's right. But we buy the dinners, so that's, remember that. Proposed, uh, we're moving on to board matters, 1901. Um, if everyone goes to that, that'll be the proposed amendment to policy 115, compensation and reimbursement of school board members. Um, first reading, Ms. Jesse. Um, I move that the Prince William County School Board adopt the attached amendment to the Prince to School Board Policy 115, compensation and reimbursement of school board members to permit reimbursement for mileage to and from official school board functions and activities both within and outside of school board a member's district, including local school board meetings and the attendance at local, state, and national programs providing educational or professional development for school board. Do you have a second? Second. Ms. Williams, second. Ms. Jesse, first. Do I have a discussion? Yeah. Ms. Jesse. Okay. Uh, this uh, policy was changed, and prior to this, school board members were allowed to uh, receive compensation for travel. Uh, many people do not know that we don't have an office. Our office is our home. So once we leave our home, 
we're on travel. I've been in the system for a long time, and I think that um, I was a supervisor for Title I, and when I left my office, I was compensated for travel. Uh, the same thing for as a principal, uh, we receive compensation for travel in central office. Some of central office people have cars um, and travel from their home in county cars. It's the same thing for um, the uh, persons including the, I'm sorry, principals, central office, and for Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors receive travel. Um, private sector. My husband was in the private sector. When he left his home from the, and went to another place, he, they compensated him for a taxi or something of that nature. Uh, we looked at Fairfax and other jurisdictions who receive compensation, and some people request reimbursement and some do not. Many members of this board do not request reimbursement, and there's, I have no problem with that, but as a board, I think we need to look through the lens of other than being middle-class Americans. Uh, when people come on this board, uh, they should be allowed to at least get compensation for the use of their cars, and some are not middle-class people who would, would be able to afford to not get that compensation. Of course, you guys know what our salaries are, and we get a small compensation for the travel. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's for school board members that it's being able to apply if you want your travel or not to apply and not feeling guilty if that person does apply for travel. And so this is why this is on the board, uh, Docs. And there was a question about being in your district. Well, where would you travel other than your district? Uh, and I, of course, many of us travel outside. Those of us who do not work are during the day activities are doing a great deal of travel. There's not a lot of compensation in it, but it's a right, the right to receive compensation for travel. And those are my comments. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I um, want to echo Ms. Jesse's statements. Uh, mostly, for me, it's a matter of just making sure that we are in line with not only um, other school divisions around us, but also our county government officials who are allowed to uh, claim travel reimbursement from their office to anywhere that they travel. And for me, as always, it's not about this board. It's about any other board that comes after us. By changing this policy, we've essentially restricted the rights of people following us um, and limited their abilities to make that to be able to apply for travel. I'm compensated in my private sector and have been in every position that I have in the private sector. And I personally don't put in for travel reimbursement from the school board, but it doesn't mean that I can't. And it, I don't feel that it's the duty of this board to make this a more restrictive position. Um, Myself, I probably should, because I could definitely use the funding for the amount of time I spend living in my car, um, being on the school board. Um, but it's a matter of, we always want diversity when we have elected officials come and represent us. And when we think about diversity, most of the time we think in terms of male or female or race or ethnicity, but there's also a, a part of it which is financial diversity. And being an elected official, it's a privilege really because the majority of us can't afford this lifestyle. It, you know, it requires time away from your family. It re requires you to have a job that allows you to be flexible to do this position. Every little bit could help make that determination for someone wanting to be um, a school board member in this case, or even you know other positions. Every little bit matters, especially in today's society and economy. And I just think it um, personally, it's a very limited sight of all of us on the board to restrict other people from having that privilege because that's what it is. It'll always be up to the individual and whether or not they'd like to claim it. Um, but I, I did find it interesting that you know Alexandria 
we don't know if they can or cannot. We know that uh, school board members don't claim it. Fairfax, they are allowed, um, and they're also the largest, and we're the second largest school division, uh, 35th in the nation. Uh, Loudoun, again, small one, they don't have a provision. Stafford, they're uh, able to do so. I'm not sure why Virginia Beach is in here, um, but they are able to also cl claim reimbursement. Um, so I know that uh, there's often been some pushback on, from the board when um, we have a proposal up here by individual board members, but I'm asking our fellow board members, or my fellow board members to think uh, past that and to think about what this could mean to someone sitting in this seat, especially since it's an election year and all of us are not coming back. Um, this vote will make a difference in this position for years and years to come. And I think it's only right that we fall in line with not only our county representatives on the Board of County Supervisors, but other jurisdictions as well. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll be voting no, uh, just, just for uh, my perspective, um, as both active duty military for a number of years and as a corporate, I was always expected to pay my own way to get, my, get, to, get to my job. Um, as this, for, for this position, my job is my district, my job is the school board. I expect to pay, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect for me to pay to get to my, place here. Um, for people that, if we, if we would drive down to Williamsburg for the, for the conference and stuff like that, I have no issue with that. Driving down to Richmond, I have no issue with that, like I said. But within the district, I consider that's, that's kind of our obligation and place to work. So I'll be voting no. Miss so, um, Williams. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on that now that you mentioned that, Mr. Trenum, that brings up a very good point. Um, it, you know, <laughs> It's also our job to come here, which is outside of our, our districts. Um, we don't submit reimbursement for coming to these meetings. Um, when I leave my office, even if I'm in the city and I'm going somewhere else in DC, I'm allowed reimbursement. Um, I, I appreciate your comment and I do think, you know, you, you don't get paid to go to your job, but this is a special position, meaning that oftentimes we fill in for one another outside of our districts, but the majority of stuff goes along in our own district. And it's not just uh, the main thing that we are responsible for is policy, which means coming to this meeting. So there's a lot of extracurricular things that we do as board members that we're not required to do, but is very much appreciated by our individual schools, our constituents, students, and families that fall within our district. And, uh, and most people know around here with traffic, it's hard to get outside of your district to make it to these events in time um, because they're usually starting at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. So I just wanted to remind other board members as well when we undertake this decision that it's not just about getting to your specific job because the only job we actually have to do is to come here. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we did receive the list with surrounding districts policies and local mileage reimbursement and as has been talked about Alexandria board members do not claim local mileage in or outside their school district Fairfax County there's a provision for board members to claim mileage however they do not submit for reimbursement Loudoun County there's no provision for board members to claim mileage within their school district Stafford County there's a provision for board members to claim local mileage in and outside their school district however they do not submit for reimbursement Virginia Beach, there's a provision for board members to claim local mileage, however, they do not submit for reimbursement. You know, we're given a salary to do this job, and it's, this is public service. We all knew coming into this, we weren't doing it for the money, this is public service. And when I, when I started the job, you know, I was told going to Richmond, going to official school board functions, um, we could claim for mileage. And I've rarely claimed anything. Um, I've, I've claimed just a few trips over the years, usually to something like Richmond or Williamsburg. Um, and yes, that was my choice because I'm not very good about turning things in in a timely manner. Now, as if we're going to get into this, um, like I said last time, then we need to define exactly what's meant by official school board functions because there are some members who have claimed, there's a member who's claimed some functions that were not official school board functions. And they have claimed those for mileage that has been paid out from Prince William County School funds, that's not right. Um, we, if we're, going to do, if we're going to dig into this, then we also need to dig into conferences. Which conferences are considered official school board conferences? When I came on the board, I was told it was 
VSBA conferences, Virginia School Board Association, or NSBA, National School Board Association. Those were the conferences you could go to. And if we're going to get into this, then maybe we need to spell out exactly which conferences are allowed without the school board voting to approve it, because there have been conferences that have been allowed that are outside of that that cost a lot more than the conferences that everybody else has gone to. Um, I think if somebody is claiming, if someone is putting in so many claims for mileage that in a month they're actually making more than their school board salary, there's some concern there. And um, you, maybe we need to look at this from a larger perspective. Do we need to think about a stipend? Do we need to really study this from a national perspective and see what the trends are? Um, I, I'm going to vote no to this um, because I don't think this is right because of, of what I have studied looking into this. I will not vote for this. So I'll weigh in here a bit, and, and, I, and I think some of uh, Ms. Satterwhite's ideas are actually pretty good. Um, one of the thoughts that I had, Ms. Jesse, is that to make it simple, because um, one of the reasons we reviewed this policy to begin with is to simplify, streamline our 100 series. And one of the ways we thought about doing it was doing what we did with this back in October. But one thought, you know, in a sense of fairness, um, is that if we brought the school board's um, uh, if they if they want reimbursed for mileage, that it should be the same policy that all division school employees have. So one way to look at it is whatever criteria requirements the school board the school's division employees have, the school board um, should um, abide by those as well. And that that's one thought to think about as you. Um, if you'd like to consider that. And one thought could be to defer this to maybe, as, as Ms. Satterwhite points out, spell out more specifically the kinds of things that would be, um, that would be, would be appropriate um, within the guidelines of what the school system already does. Just your, some thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to deferring it and getting more information. I, I would like to respond that um, when I, 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 I'm just shocked that a board member would say that I infer that members of this board have asked more money than you. We make a thousand dollars. We what? What is it? A thousand dollars a month? And. To my knowledge, I am the only one who has applied for travel. So if you've been looking at my travel, and now you are accusing me, my integrity is the only thing I have. You don't mess with that. This, this school system, I, no, excuse me. I'm, I have Jesse, the, I, I have didn't the mention any names. No, I know. But On I purpose. have talked to the clerks. I know who applies for travel. So let's stick to the policy. Yeah, okay, for wait, now. sir. I will just say this. We should not feel guilty for applying for travel. For me personally, if this school system, it would you would owe me thousands of dollars for travel I have not taken. Every principal I know, we work when I retired. The school system owed me, I don't know, thousands of dollars. I'm very sorry that I had to go to this, but when you start getting personal with this, fine. But I agree that we should defer it. And I really don't want any more discussion about school board's personal travel. It's, it's inappropriate. Mr. Deutsch, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so last fall, we as a board were going through our uh, board policies and uh, for how we as a board operate. Uh, reimbursement is part of, part of that policy. Uh, one of the things that when I came on the board, I asked, hey, can somebody show me what can I be reimbursed for as a board member? I just want to know what the rules are, what we can do. Um, due to the way things are, and I, th um, what you can be reimbursed for is in a lot of different spots, and there wasn't anything simple that's all in one place. Here's what you can be reimbursed for. It seemed very natural uh, that in the 
uh, board reimbursement policy on, under our finances uh, here, we spell out. So it's just black and white, clear to everybody, here's what it is. Uh, and I made sure uh, during that discussion, uh, people may have noticed I, at one point I pulled the item because we didn't have everything spelled out. Here's what people can be reimbursed for. Uh, made sure we came back. Uh, there was work between board members, staff, to here's how we can, here, here's a proposal. Uh, and that proposal passed unanimously. Uh, this was not an effort by um, staff to come up with something to go after board members. Um, honestly, I drove it. I wanted to have it spelled out for our own protection, for the public to know as well. Uh, here's, what, here's what we can be reimbursed for. Uh, and every board member on this day has voted for it. Every board member, uh, we had red lines, we had notes coming to us in advance. We knew what the policy was. Uh, and so everyone, everyone voted for it. Uh, it did, on the issue of mileage and of reimbursements, it did, uh, it did three things. Um, first of all, it spells out that uh, mileage can only be for official school board functions. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about what types of trips one can uh, get reimbursed for. There are a lot of different things that as an official, uh, elected official, you might be invited to because we're an elected official, but that may not be an official school board function. It may be because people, for some reason, think we're important and they want us to come to other things as well. Um, but that's not something that the taxpayers that pay for the school system should be reimbursing us for uh, if we're invited to those as well. Uh, and then it just spelled out to make sure that what we're getting reimbursed for is the long trips that are out of the ordinary. So trips to official meetings outside the county. Um, honestly, it, it even left room, hey, if there's a, an important county function on the opposite end of the county, that's a long drive, you know, people can get reimbursed for it. Uh, but it added some clarity, and every board member on this day has voted for it at the time. Um, and there's been a bunch of discussion about um, surrounding districts. I think we actually have the slide um, in the back, if that can be put on the screen. Um, just, this is, just so the public is aware, um, this is what research from our staff uh, came up with in terms of what surrounding jurisdictions allow. Um, we would be going out of the ordinary to allow these changes. Um, excuse me, I'm, yes ma'am, um, excuse me, I'm speaking. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Deutsch. Um, there, there are numerous surrounding jurisdictions that are very large that we enjoy comparing ourselves to. Uh, for none of them do you see board members claiming local mileage. It just doesn't happen. So what we're, what we're discussing is something uh, out of the ordinary for the region. Uh, and so that's why I think it's important to stick to things, uh, to what the policy we as a board already agreed to. Uh, and then if we're going to look at um, some kind of equalizing with what school staff um, does in terms of reimbursement, I still think we need everything spelled out inside our own board policies, just so everybody can go to one spot, see very clearly here's what people can be reimbursed for, instead of having to go to a number of different internal documents. Uh, so if we, if we were to go that route, I think still pulling it all together um, putting it all right there is important, but I think people need to ask the question, why is a board revisiting something they supported unanimously back in the fall? Uh, I'm going to go to Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to offer an amendment um, and I, to the current motion on the floor that the uh, school board travel reimbursement policy be in line with the current P Prince William County School employee travel and policies um, as we are employees of the school division, um, like to try to dead some of this controversy that it is only a big deal now that we're making a, a change to something that we voted on, which has happened quite a few times since I've sat on this board, but somehow this evening is just a miraculous uh, new thing, um, so that we can not have to spell out what conference, because those change, um, educational needs change, what you, um, may use to do this job may change. So therefore, if we are under the same policies as the rest of Prince William County Schools employees, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so, we can be falling right along with them. So I, I'll, I'll second it and to clarify the motion, you're asking Ms. Williams to do a substitute motion. So Correct. for compensation reimbursement of school board matter members, 
the Prince William County School Board should be reimbursed based on the same policies that division employees are for travel. Yes. And that'll be as simple as that. Yes. And based on whatever school board regulations are, can we put that up and we'll take a vote on that substitution? We can have a discussion on the substitution. What point I have a second on the motion, yeah. Point of information. What language in the policy are we striking? And where are we inserting this line? So I, I would strike the whole thing and just put the Prince William County School Board uh, members will abide by the travel reimbursement that all division employees follow. You want to strike the entire policy? Strike, we, we, we just, yeah, so basically this policy talks about mileage, this, that. What we're going to do is simplify it to just say school board members follow the same policy that division employees do for travel reimbursement. There are other things in here besides travel reimbursement if you're striking the whole policy. Let's fight about it some more. And um, uh, the idea is just to make it simple. Well, it it makes us equal, right, no, making us equal to our division employees. So, I understand. So, I'm trying hold to figure on. out what we're voting on. That, that's what we're voting on. Okay, so we can just say. Can we defer to come back? Yes, Miss Carroll. It's very different, right? There are some things that right? just are not perfect fits. It does cover reimbursement for um, supplies, et cetera, as it's, as it's discussed and contemplated in this. But two things that you may want to take into account when you look at that, regu that regulation. One is that um, it doesn't define um, it, 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 our it's for travel only. Is, is a little different. For it would be different only. for you, yeah. so that would have to be different. And the other thing that you may want to consider is that that, con that regulation contemplates that the employee's su supervisor will, oh, sorry. That the employee's supervisor will approve um, the purchases, will approve the travel, and that is different for you all because you don't have a supervisor. So it's, you, you could adopt a parallel structure, but those are questions that, or, that you would have to provide some guidance on for staff as how, to, how you would want them to implement so, that. So if it'd be okay with Ms. Jesse, then I'd ask for division council clarification before we vote on this and bring this up at another time. Or table of deferred. And we can do that. Okay. Yes. Diane had a comment. Ms. Ralston. Thank you. Are we considered employees? Yeah. So we'll let it she, as, no. as part of our, go ahead. Is it, um, the board members are not considered employees Thank for some you. purposes and for others they can, but the regulation about employee reimbursement is not, it, it, there are some aspects of it that are not a perfect fit because um, the approval, there's a discretion given to a supervisor and to financial services as to whether or not they're going to um, approve in cases as to what, whether it's official or not. And, and the problem is, I think you'll have a, an issue with um, your subordinates would be approving your travel and setting the rules for what is or what is not. So the regulation, just adopting the regulation is not a perfect fit to be able to answer the questions for how the procedures would be for you. Um, Ms. Williams has a question. Uh, no, I was just saying it's not for all employee reimbursement. It's just specific to travel, um, not supplies and things of that nature, because we're only discussing travel. That's why I said in the amendment right. for travel and, and, specifically. And the, the existing, your existing reg policy, policy says that you'll follow that regulation in terms of the reimbursement for supplies and things like that. Um, but even as to travel, if you read the employee regulation, it says that your supervisor will approve the travel in advance, and the, the, it's not a legal issue as opposed to a practical operational issue for you, is that um, there is no supervisor of you to approve the travel in the first place. So I think there would have to be guidance given okay. to staff as to how they would so, implement that for you. May I, may I, add, may I add something here? As a principal, I was a principal for 20 years and submitted travel. And the travel goes up and it's approved. Since I am the person on the board who has submitted my travel, when my travel goes up, it is presented to the clerk. The clerk does, it has to be approved. My travel so, still has to be approved. So I, I think we need some clarification. I, I give the floor. 
So I think we'll table this for clear, legal clarification. And if we bring this back up, it'll be a clean amendment and we can vote on it at that point. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go next to board matters. Point, point, point of order, oh, that has yeah. to be a motion to table. There's, a, there's an amendment on the floor right now that hasn't been voted on and we can't table without a vote to table. Carol. Yeah, you do need a vote. Thank you. Okay, so do I have a motion to table it? Can I make the motion? Do I have any opposition to tabling the motion? Make the motion. No. Okay, so I have a motion to table it and I see no opposition to table it. Thank you. That should be it. We should go to board matters. And uh, we'll start with Willie Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, budget season is always uh, an exciting time. Uh, we have a very uh, well-built-out budget uh, that provides a lot of things for a lot of different people. And uh, I think a lot of people are excited about different aspects. Uh, there's always ways to improve, but there's definitely a budget that has, has a lot of people happy. Um, it's always it's an interesting thing to have a boardroom filled with people insisting that we pass the budget that we already have proposed, um, which is definitely different than the past few years. Uh, and so um, I think tomorrow we've got a budget work session. We'll have markup coming up. Uh, one of the things that over the last year and heading into this year uh, that we've done as a board is uh, last year we made the uh, decision to fund uh, turf fields at both Woodbridge and Stonewall Jackson High School. Uh, this year's budget includes a turf field for uh, Battlefield High School. Uh, and so as a, as a board at this point, we've made a essentially a policy change to shift towards turf fields. And so one of the things that I think is crucial for a, an equity of fairness thing across the division is that other schools that are interested in turf fields uh, have a timeline provided for when they can uh, get those turf fields. Uh, and I think there's, there's been discussion about that, but I think it's important that uh, particularly for uh, the older schools that still do not have turf fields uh, that would like them, uh, particularly we're talking about uh, Garfield, Hilton, Osborne Park, uh, and if Brentsville is interested, but they may not be, um, that when we pass our uh, CIP this year, uh, that we make sure to include in it a timeline uh, for when we plan on funding those turf fields as well. Uh, we have timelines for renovations, we have timelines for new buildings uh, in our 10-year CIP. Uh, establishing that timeline so that every school knows that uh, they're known, they're noticed, we believe they're important, and that we're going to bring all of them, at least on that matter, up to the same level. Uh, I think would be important, especially for some of our particularly older schools in Garfield, Hilton, and Osborne Park, uh, to make sure that they are, uh, that we, we show that we value them. Uh, and so I think, uh, just one thing to put on the radar as we uh, continue through budget season. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are in the midst of budget season and, and um, there's a lot of public uh, comment uh, time uh, for people to uh, make suggestions for their budget and I always advocate that our community comes out to our work sessions and also um, to these meetings so that they're aware of what's going on with the school division and offer any ideas and suggestions um, because I don't believe any one of us knows everything and we all have our specialties. Um, it's funny because as board members, we throw around the word equity as if our own defining lens and perspective is encompassing of what that means and how it is affects each of our own schools and within our districts. And I think that the one thing that we're lacking in the school division is an equity committee um, made up of a diverse body of citizens and possibly some board members so that we can really understand the true equity issues of this school division because it's not always about turf fields, it's about facilities and what that really means. Like we talk about overcrowded classrooms, but in my division, it's not a matter of overcrowded 
overcrowded classrooms. It's an, a matter of an overcrowded building and trying to get people to understand the difference between adding another teacher or having students have five lunch shifts because the building is not big enough, but there's only 19 kids in a class. Or maybe the fact that I'm an alumni of Woodbridge High School and my high school still looks the same way pretty much as it did when I graduated in 95 versus Colgan and why there are differences, because there are gonna be differences. One's a new building, one's a not a new building. What does that mean? How building codes change and that affects what you can put in a building or you can't put in a building. Because we don't ever really take time to, down, to go down to the nitty gritty of the issues to explain um, really why we can and can't do things. We don't often talk about the, the positive and negatives or where we're restricted as a school division, maybe because of county regulations, maybe because of funding. But I think maybe it's time that we have or at least start that conversation um, because it's important. I don't, I'm not so sure that everyone has the same definition of equity and, and what that means to someone and, and what that means in a, from district to district and, and versus old versus new or financial, uh, financially. And I think um, if, my, if my fellow board members would agree, maybe we can start that committee and really truly dig into that conversation in today's time and possibly have a, an opportunity to reflect on our own selves and our lens of privileges that each of us wear um, as we approach this position and, and speak from um, speak on behalf of our districts. Um, and then finally, um, along that lines, um, I don't often say too much in this arena, but I've sat here for about six years and I was raised that if you don't have nothing, if you don't have something nice to say, that you shouldn't say it. And I've sat up here and watched um, my fellow board members not be so nice to each other. And I hope and pray that we can rectify that situation and not sit up here and um, pick on each other because we don't like what someone has to say about that person. I try to keep my personal opinions to myself when it comes to making votes and making policy decisions. I don't have to like everybody up here in order to um, vote for the good of my district and the good of the school system. I don't even have to agree with, there's plenty of things that I personally don't agree with, but I know is good for the division or good for the district. Um, I know, I'm sure uh, Mr. Deutsch can testify because I've told him plenty of times, it's not personal to you. Maybe I, I think he's got great policy ideas sometimes, but sometimes I don't agree with whatever it is that he says, but it doesn't affect how I vote or whether I pick on someone. And if I do, I always say, I'm gonna pick on you and this is why, um, so that you understand it's for example. Um, but I've noticed that there's been an uptick in several years, in the past few years of that type of behavior from this board and we don't really address it publicly, but I think enough is enough. Um, we all are guilty from time to time and having a bad day and taking it out on someone or things of that nature. But I think, myself included, we could all do a better job of working together and, and being nonpartisan about our decision making and our votes and thinking about, as I implore each and every one of you often, to not just today's environment, but what comes down the pike in the future for our kids, for our students, and for people who sit in the seat after us. Because part of the reason we're in the situation we're in is because we only think short term about who's sitting here now. So um, I hope that we can all consider that and move forward from there. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. Point, point of information, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we passed a policy uh, putting t uh, three minute clocks on our board matter speeches. Are we timing them? Okay, we will. Ms. Jesse. Are you clocking me? I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, it has been a challenging uh, month or so because w w uh, I hate to say that for me, it has been a series of losses. And uh, one is personal, but the Jenkins and Mr. Harper, and a person that Amy White knows, and the custodian at my school. Um, I, I mention her name because sometimes we, 
we recognize people like John Harper and we recognize people like John Jenkins. And then there's the Suzanne Blaze of the world who for six straight years, we had the cleanest building in Prince William County. And I had the honor of giving the eulogy for her. But when she, the week or so before she passed away, and Dr. Walsh, I think I've talked about her before, but you know what she asked me? She, she kept saying, every time I went to her house, she was not always lucid, but she said, Miss Jessie, you promised to get me a job. When am I going back to work? That's the last thing she said to me. When am I going back to work? And there are people who make contributions in the system, and I know that maybe I shouldn't have brought her up in this light, but I just wanted to recognize the custodians of the world and the people who do great things. And I'll tell you right now that if I didn't show up for work or Dr. Waltz didn't show up for work, if the custodians didn't show up, who would be missed first? It wouldn't be me and Dr. Waltz. So I digress, I digress a little bit. I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm sorry, it's kind of emotional for me tonight, but um, I will say whoever have access to travel for individuals, that shouldn't happen. And finally, I want to, um, I was at Westridge, and I want to shout out to a little kid named James. As I was reading my book, he said, I've written a book also. So James, I just want to bring your name to the board tonight, and I'm coming back to Westridge. Woodbridge High School, my husband and I were there when they beat uh, the Titans. And th they've got a great basketball team. And uh, we always talk about men and basketball and football, but these girls are doing some great things. Finally, on the turf, we had a young man come up tonight and talk about concussion. We did not know years ago what was happening on football fields. And I, I say to you, we really need to look at this crumb rubber because we can't just wait until someone becomes ill for us to take action. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to give comment tonight. It's been a long night for me. Ms. Ralston. I pass. <laughs> Mr. Trenum. I'll pass. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the folks at Westgate Elementary School. I had a wonderful time reading to their students on Monday. It was an absolute delight to spend time with them. On Saturday and Sunday, I want to recognize Battlefield High School's I Light 1885 team for hosting the first Chesapeake Robotics Competition. Deep Space is the theme, and they had a huge job hosting a competition for, I want to say it was 40 plus teams. It was a great event. I want to thank Dr. Waltz for stopping by and seeing the students also on Sunday. Um, as was mentioned earlier during citizen comment time, uh, there's going to be an internet safety night that I'm hosting with along with a couple of others on March 18th at 7 p.m. at Battlefield High School. Doors will open at 6.30, and I hope everybody will come out for that. Um, Dr. Waltz isn't here, so Mr. Iman. Um, <laughs> when the Infrastructure Task Force gave the report, there was referenced a principal survey, and it was mentioned that we could get a copy of that, and we haven't received that yet. Could you... Get us copy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. And then um, I didn't get a chance to say anything um, about Mr. Jenkins tonight, but I also just wanted to um, say what an honor it was tonight to name the new elementary school in the Parkway after Mr. Jenkins. Um, he was a gentleman, and he was a he was just the the epitome of a public servant, and he was respected and loved by everybody, and. Um, Ernestine, if you're still watching, um, we love you, and we loved your husband, and it is such an honor to be able to do that tonight and to recognize him for his years of selfless sacrifice and public service that he gave all of us. Thank you. Mr. Wilk. I just, we can say Ms. Williams had my time. It's good. I defer it to her. <laughs> um, so... It was a great evening. We named um, the newest elementary school, John, G John D. Jenkins Elementary, a very exciting night. 
Uh, been a sad couple weeks, and I'm glad Dr. Uh, Waltz put up the picture of John Harper, who was a terrific guy. I've known him actually a long time, one of the first gentlemen I met when I moved to the county. Um, used to make me meet him at 7 a.m. at Bob Evans. He liked early meetings. Um, but a terrific gentleman and a uh, wonderful family. The first African-American ever elected in Prince William County. He was elected to the school board in the 1990s, so a tremendous gentleman. And, and you've heard this evening a lot about um, Supervisor John Jenkins uh, and his family. Terrific um, uh, evening, excited to be a part of naming that school, and, and it was universal. So I can't tell you folks how, how well-loved he was and how everyone I talked to thought it was a wonderful idea. Uh, a couple quick things. Uh, congratulations, Woodbridge Senior High School girls basketball team for being state champions once again. Robotics, uh, the VEX state champions were, uh, championships were this past weekend in uh, Doswell, Doswell, Doswell. I was down there this weekend. Uh, we saw the Benton Middle School win the state championship. Uh, we had uh, Benton Middle School students going against Benton Middle School, middle school students, so both teams were in the finals. Uh, so it was a terrific um, weekend, and the high school students also did very well. We had a tremendous showing of uh, Prince William County Schools at the state championships, thanks to Superintendent Waltz for the robotics programs that they started when he came on board here. They are um, exactly the kinds of things that uh, promote discovery, innovation, collaboration, and communication with others. And it's uh, a great example of the kinds of extracurricular activities I love to see our students participate in. Uh, and, and hope to see more of that as we expand that across the county. Last, um, uh, you know, I can't even read my handwriting tonight, but um, so we'll, we'll wrap it up. But it was a wonderful evening, and uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to come to the work session, we'll see you tomorrow. Meeting adjourned.